Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Well, today I am speaking with a guest who many of you may not have heard of. He is a clinical psychologist at the University of Toronto by the name of Jordan Peterson, who has become quite famous online recently for standing in opposition to changes to the Human Rights Code in Ontario, Canada, that have really direct relevance to him as a professor. And he's been on many different podcasts, Joe Rogan, Dave Rubin, Gad Sad, I think. So, you know, many people who you may also listen to have interviewed him. And he is actually, as I say at the beginning of this interview, the most requested guest I have had at this point by all of you. I can't tell you how many people have emailed me or tweeted at me demanding that I have Jordan on the podcast. And it's really in anticipation of us not talking about free speech, but about his beliefs about religion and its importance, the connection between religious truth and scientific truth, the importance of mythology. All of this is, is stuff that has come out in his other interviews, which many atheists and secularists have found both perplexing and inspiring. I've seen many atheists say that this, you know, Jordan is giving a the first construal of religion that I find hard to grapple with, that is interesting, that seems morally important and intellectually honest. So many, many of you have wanted to get the two of us together so that we could presumably butt heads on these topics. So I did invite Jordan on the podcast, and you are about to hear that conversation. And I am, as I say at the end, going to rely on all of you to figure out what happened. Because from my point of view, we got bogged down on a very narrow point of more than just philosophical interest. We got bogged down on what it means to say that something is true or not. And to my eye, we didn't take that analysis very far because we immediately hit rather significant impediment and difference of opinion about what is entailed there. And I just couldn't get Jordan to agree on some facts that seem so basic to me that I was uncomfortable moving forward on other topics until we ironed that out. And it took more than two hours to get to a point where I thought, well, this is, this is a good stopping point. We will see whether, based on the, the public reception to this, whether it is useful to move on to talk about morality and myth and religion and all the rest. I wanted to be my best self for the rest of that conversation. And I just, I was running out of energy and patience there. So I decided to pull the brakes. But you, you, you now have two hours of me and Jordan butting heads on a variety of topics related to scientific epistemology, for lack of a better word. Please judge for yourselves how we did and what was going on there. It's not absolutely clear to me what we disagree about, but you'll hear me attempt to push really as hard as I could to get some answers there, and, and I really don't feel that I got them. So the fault could absolutely be mine, and I will rely on you to inform me of that. So I don't know where this is best done, perhaps on Reddit, but somebody bring my attention to what gets said here, if anything useful gets said in response to this podcast. These are all experiments in conversation. Now I bring you another one. Please enjoy my conversation with Jordan Peterson. I am here with Jordan Peterson. Jordan, thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Well, listen, you, you have the distinction of being, I think, without question, the person who my listeners most requested that I talk to. So congratulations. People really want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, well, I think they want to hear what we both have to say. So, and hopefully we can we can manage that in a in a way that works out real well. That would be good as far as I'm concerned. Actually, I'm very hopeful we'll have a, an interesting conversation here. I think you know you seem to suddenly be everywhere on the internet, and and you've been on many other podcasts. And I think we should talk briefly about the reasons why you've suddenly become so visible. But I don't think we should spend a lot of time on them because I think that's territory where you and I will almost fully converge. And I think that's not what people are most interested in, in having us talk about. But 
to just get people up to speed with what's been happening with you and why you've been so visible all of a sudden. Let's talk briefly about the free speech issues, the gender pronoun issues, what's happening in Canada around this bill, C-16, and the, and the gender provision in the Ontario Human Rights Code. Just bring us up to speed there. And I, again, I think we should spend probably no more than 10 minutes or so there, and then we'll move on to areas where you and I may not fully agree. 10 minutes would be plenty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Canada moved at the federal level, level to institute some legislation that on the surface of it seems more or less in keeping with the extension of human rights protection to different groups uh, that's been occurring, say, over the last 30 to 50 years. Um, this time they extended protection to gender identity and gender expression. Um, the first problem with that, although by no means the worst problem, is that gender expression is not a group. And as far as I can tell from reading the Ontario Human Rights Commission website policies, which the federal government announced they, that the provisions of Bill C-16 would be interpreted within, it's now, you can now pro provisionally be prosecuted under the hate crime uh, hate crime legislation federally for criticizing someone's choice of fashion. And I'm not being cynical about that. Um, that's the Ontario Human Rights Commission policies describe gender expression as the manner in which people present themselves through such while well, doing everyday activities like shopping through their choice of clothes and dress. And the idea that that requires protection of that magnitude, well, I think it's, I think it's, if you keep extending rights, all you do is weaken them. You know, you, it, rights are, some, one person's rights are another person's responsibilities. And anyways, that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is that the code, the Ontario provisions, which are like lurking behind the federal law and are already law in Ontario, require the use of these so-called preferred pronouns if someone requests them. And I have a variety of objections to that, the most fundamental of which is I believe that the manufactured pronouns, the Z and the Zer and the 50 sort of variants of those are... Just for a moment, describe yeah. what you're referring to there, because I, I think even among my audience, this is an arcane topic. What are these manufactured pronouns? Well, there it's dogma, I would say, among the radical left that gender is a social construct and that there are multiple variants of gender, gender identity. And some of those don't fit neatly into male-female classifications. The legislation says that people can inhabit any position on that spectrum or, or not be on the spectrum at all between male and female, which, of course, I find that particular claim essentially incomprehensible. Um, anyways, the theory is, is that people who are non-binary, which is the terminology, are entitled to be referred to by pronouns other than he or she, hmm. which include they, which would, I suppose, be the most moderate compromise, and then a host of other pronouns that have appeared basically out of the void over the last 10 years, including words like Z and Zer and Her, which would be H-I-R, and hmm. Zem. And there's a, there's a, truly, there's like 70 different sets of them. Right. And there's no um, agreement whatsoever on which ones should be used. And none of them have entered popular parlance because they are bad solutions to the problem. And the legislation nonetheless necessitates their use. And this is the first time that Canadian government has moved to make a particular kind of speech content mandatory. You know, there are certain limitations on speech, although not very many of them. But this is the first time out of the commercial realm that the actual contents of speech have been made um, mandatory. And my particular objection to this is that I believe, and I think I have good evidence for believing that these made up pronouns, these manufactured pronouns are part of the lexicon of the radical postmodern slash neo-Marxist left. And it's part of their general agenda to occupy the linguistic territory 
that we use for common parlance, and I don't like their philosophy. In fact, I regard it as reprehensible, to say the least. And because of that, I'm not willing to cede linguistic territory to them, certainly not by being forced to use ideologically um, would saturated as an ideologically saturated lexicon. Mm. And so I said I wouldn't do it. I made a video, um, three videos actually, complaining about, you know, let's say criticizing Bill C-16 in the background legislation, which also, by the way, makes employers responsible for any word that their employees utter that causes anyone any offense, intended or unintended, whether or not the employer knows that that utterance occurred, which seems to me a little bit on the draconian side, but I think is in keeping with the same philosophy, which is by no means pro-business. Um, and there are other elements of mm. what's going on in the background that are equally reprehensible. Toronto, Canada, Ontario has set up social justice tribunals. That's their technical name, which gives you some insight into their purpose. and and into their staffing. One of those is the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and they've basically decided that they have the right to suspend normal legal normal legal and judicial procedure, and that they can more or less ascribe to themselves whatever rights they, whatever powers they choose, and that's written in their policy statements. And so I'm not very happy about any of that. And so also at the same time, the University of Toronto made it mandatory for their human resources employees to undergo unconscious bias training against racism, which is also something again that I don't, I don't believe the science for documenting unconscious bias is anywhere near advanced to the point where it should be used as a diagnostic indicator of the potential prejudice of an, of entire classes of people. Um, I, uh, and and. I, I don't think there's any question that the, the tool is too weak to do that, certainly by the standards of appropriate psychometric tests. And there's certainly no evidence that these training programs that are popping up anywhere do any good with regards to prejudice and a fair bit that they actually make it worse. Right. So anyways, I made two videos, posted them on my YouTube channel. Um, mostly I did it fairly late at night and I was just trying to think this stuff through, you know, to get a, get it straight in my head and to, and, and and to lay out the argument and well the response to them was absolutely insane really mm -hmm. uh, um, there's 180 separate newspapers articles written and two protests at the University of Toronto and I received two warning letters from the administration and uh, a letter of censure from a number of my fellow academics and postdocs and graduate students at the University of Toronto and it was it was news literally well to, yesterday the toronto star published like a 3000 word biography of me in toronto life which is i suppose our equivalent to new yorker although not in the same league is going to publish a 5000 word bio on me and um well and then i've talked to joe rogan and a whole bunch of other people mm. for podcast it's been crazy it's it's yeah. but the reason for that is because I made something that was bubbling underneath the surface of our culture um, and was certainly bubbling under the surface of yours at the last election. I made it concrete and put forth my objections in an articulate manner, and it struck a chord with people. And, and it's actually been news not only in Canada, but it's stretched its tentacles down to the States and, and certainly into West, you know, the West, Western Europe and Australia and New Zealand. And, I'm being interviewed in South Africa this week, and it's been absolutely, it's been like being in a ship in a storm, and I, yeah. and it's it's dumbfounding. I can imagine it's been it's been stressful. I'm sure. Now, is, is your job at the University of Toronto in jeopardy? Is that the kind of communication you've received, or? Well, I received two warning letters, basically asking me to stop talking about this, based on the idea that even talk, even mentioning the fact that I might not use these pronouns probably contravened the Ontario Human Rights Code and also the University Code of Conduct. Although hypothetically, the University's Code of Conduct is dominated by protection for free speech, and so 
they kind of did the typical HR thing and got the lawyers on it and they're conservative and you know they warned me twice um, I didn't stop talking about it but then the university was roundly criticized by a number of Canada's major journalists including a coalition of a hundred newspapers and uh, they got a lot of bad press uh, the press actually turned in support of me quite hard about two weeks after this started when they started to investigate what I was talking about and found out that I actually knew what I was knew what I was that my claims weren't um, exaggerated by any stretch of the imagination. Mm. And so I've seen that criticism. I, I've paid attention to what you've been saying on this topic. And some people have said that you are at least mistaken about the the legal implications of these changes in the law or these rulings. But it seems to me you the one thing you can't be mistaken about is the treatment you have received thus far in response to your saying you won't use these pronouns. If the university lawyers hadn't been convinced that I was correct in my interpretation, they wouldn't have sent out a warning that I should stop doing it because it might be illegal. Mm. That's the best piece of proof supporting my my position that the law has this draconian element because, you know, they didn't send me those letters incautiously. They had their lawyers review the damn legislation and then came to the same conclusion that I did. Right. And so, and the two lawyers who have been making these claims that this legislation is far more innocuous than I'm making it out to be are both social activist lawyers. And mm. so they have a, they have a serious agenda. And one of them, Brenda Cosman, told me, well, that I wouldn't go to jail, although that is a possibility, despite what she said, because the, the law does have that power. All that would happen is that essentially I could be financially ruined. It's like, right. well, okay, right. well, that's not draconian at all, you know, I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. And, the, and the Ontario Human Rights Commission has managed to demolish lots of people's lives. It's a, it's a kangaroo court, in my opinion, and, and a very dangerous one at that. One thing we absolutely agree about is that freedom of speech is not just one among many different values. It re really is the master value because it's the only corrective to human stupidity. It's the only mechanism by which we can improve our society. And in fact, it's, it's the value that allows us to improve our other values through conversation. Yes, that's exactly right. It's the fundamental value. It's exactly right. It's the fundamental value upon which our entire cultural edifice is predicated. And I believe that that's part of the reason why the postmodern radicals in particular um, are opposed to freedom of speech, because they don't really, they don't believe in dialogue. You know, they don't believe in rationality. They don't believe that groups who have different orientations of power can discuss their um, differences in a civilized manner and reach resolution, uh, because that isn't how they see the world. That's how modernists see the world, but postmodernists don't believe any of that, and they seriously don't believe it. It's no, it's not a facade, or a, it's 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 a very entrenched part of their their philosophy. Mm. So that's partly why they don't like to, well, why they block speakers who oppose their views from campus, and why they're perfectly willing to shut them down, and why they don't, you know, why they have no platforming policies, which is basically the decision not to let anyone who holds alternative views have a forum even, you know, and it's because, well, it's because they don't believe in, in rational dialogue and the possibility of reaching a solution through it. There's something, at least on its face, so wrongheaded about this pronoun campaign that it makes me feel like I don't understand something about it. Well, you don't. There's, 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 there's something more nefarious lurking at the bottom of it. And you see, in Canada, you know, I know that you're not a social constructionist. I know that you, like Steven Pinker, believe deeply that human behavior is profoundly influenced by its underlying biological substrate, which is another view that we share. But Canada has now written a social constructionist view of human identity into the law. So it's illegal. It's legally, uh, it's, it's illegal at least in principle, to claim that biology has anything to do with gender identity or that right. biology and gender identity have anything to do with gender expression or that any of those three have anything to do with social orientation in a causal manner. Right. And that's written into the law. So 
what the social justice warriors are going to do next is to go after the biologists. And, you know, they did that with E.O. Wilson already back, you know, 30 years ago. And they're doing it in Germany uh, right now. But And there's an anti-psychiatry scholarship established at the Ontario Institute for the Study of Education, which is a particularly pernicious institution. And and it's no longer obvious what sort of claims you can make as a scientist about the relationship between biology and and sex or the hypothetically separate gender identity. Right. So right. that's the worst of the lot, you know, because normally governments shy away from implementing a particular ideology, especially one that's discredited, which certainly the radical social constructionist position is to make to to impl- to you know make that a fundamental part of the law and that's definitely happened and that'll unfold in a particularly nasty way over the next 10 years ideology aside there's just a, a difference between a positive and negative injunction so you know, i can ask you to stop doing an infinite number of things and that imposes no energy cost on you i can say stop using the n word it offends me right or stop littering or stop driving your car on the sidewalk, right? And you can not do those things, and it takes no time not to do those things. It takes no cognitive overhead not to do those things. But I can't ask you to do an infinite number of things. I can't tell you to pick up all the litter you see everywhere, because you'd spend the rest of your life doing that, and you, would, you still would fail to comply with the injunction. And asking people to learn a new list of gender pronouns and then live in a state of vigilance to see that they apply them correctly. This is a positive injunction, and you're, you're, you're demanding that people do something. For me to demand that people start using a word of my own invention, or if I say I want to be addressed by a 16-digit number and I'm going to be offended if you get the number wrong, this is imposing a cost on people. I'm going to be offended, and I'm going to take you to court, and you could be charged under hate speech, and I could change that pronoun in an hour if I want, or tomorrow or the next day on a whim. Because that's also part of the legislation, because that covers the people who are so-called gender fluid. And so they have the right to transform their identity according to their subjective whim, I would say. Because the other legislation also assumes that huh, this identity that's being protected so hard has no grounding in biology, and it's only subjectively determined. So they actually go beyond social constructionism to make it essentially solipsistic. It's hmm. the only thing that determines your identity is the way that you feel at that time. So that's and that's an unbelievably poverty-stricken notion of identity, which at minimum is something that you have to negotiate with other people. I mean, it has to be functional. Yeah. And you have to negotiate it with other people. So, well, you can, it's not understandable unless you look underneath it. And that's why I was objecting, because I think it's a perfectly reasonable manifestation of the postmodernism that's nested in neo-Marxism. It's perfectly in keeping with their stated aims. So, And those aims are not, if you are an admirer of Western culture, at least the good parts of Western culture, then you're the enemy of the postmodern slash neo-Marxists. Mm. They, they're opposed to absolutely everything you believe. We're going to get into that territory, I would imagine, by another route. So I don't think there's more to say here, because I think we probably agree about everything. I'm obviously not a lawyer. I'm certainly not a Canadian lawyer. So if there's any way in which we're getting some of the legal details wrong, I offer a blanket apology, but it, but in terms of the belief that biology doesn't significantly determine gender or sexuality or the wisdom and utility of inventing new identities and demanding that everyone keep track of them in perpetuity, I mean, I think you and I more or less totally overlap there. So I, I think we should just move on. Well, you, better not, you better not come to Canada and have that discussion. Yeah. Then. yeah, well, I mean, it's just, it's been bizarre to see some of these encounters you've been having, but it's, this is why you're, you've, you've suddenly become so visible to people. And it's, it's very interesting to, to see that this is how it's manifesting. But we, we have bigger, deeper, 
more perennial fish to fry, I think we need to talk about religion and science and atheism and the foundations of morality, things like meaning, your interest in mythology, your fear of nihilism. Let's get into all of that. I think you and I share some fundamental concerns and we feel a similar kind of urgency. I think it expresses itself in slightly different ways and different ways of talking, but we, we feel an urgency that our fellow human beings get certain questions right. But I, I think we probably disagree about some fundamental matters and whether those will be, in the end, a matter of semantic difference and can be pushed to the periphery or not. I think that remains to be seen, but I think it will be interesting to talk about these things. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, huh. One of the things that I thought I might do is pursue the tack that you're not enough of a Darwinian, which I thought would be quite comical, um, because I've often thought the same about Richard Dawkins. But I would like to point out some of the things, because I've read I, I've read a fair bit of what you've written now, um, it's not by no means comprehensively, but I think uh, I've come to understand your your central claims. And of course, they're very powerful, because you're an advocate for materialist rationalism, essentially, I would say, with a bit of spirituality on the side. And, you know, materialist rationalism is an unbelievably powerful tool, and it's very coherent. And so, you know, I, I, I address the topic with trepidation, because, you know, it was certainly the case that the, the philosophical doctrine to which you adhere has transformed the world and has posed an unbelievably potent threat, let's say. That's one way of challenge. That's better to traditional views of the world. So, but there are some things that that we share in common that maybe we could start with. So, and you tell me if, if I've got any of this wrong. I think a good starting point is this, it actually leads directly into this claim about not being Darwinian enough, but it's the concept of truth. I've heard you say in a variety of ways that religious truth isn't scientific truth, and that the difference here is that science tells you what things are, and that religion tells you how you should act. So let's talk about that, and I think that does connect to this Darwinian concern of yours. Yeah, that's a good, that, well, um, I'm going to approach that obliquely to begin with. So so let me throw a couple of propositions at you. And, and I know that you don't accept Hume's distinction between an is and an ought, you know, that you're willing to challenge that. And like, fair enough, you know, um, it's a reasonable thing to try to challenge, although it's quite difficult. But, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. But I've been thinking a lot about the essential philosophical contradiction between a Newtonian worldview which I would say your view is nested inside, um, and a Darwinian worldview, because those views are not the same. They're seriously not the same. I mean, Dar the Darwinian view, as the American pragmatists recognized, so that was William James and his crowd, recognized almost, almost immediately was a form of pragmatism. And the pragmatists claim that the truth of a statement or process can only be adjudicated with regards to its efficiency with, with, in, in, attaining, in attaining its aim. And so their idea was that truths are always bounded because we're ignorant. And every uh, action that you undertake that's goal-directed has an internal ethic embedded in it. And the ethic is the claim that if what you do works, then it's true enough. And that's all you can ever do. And so, and what Darwin did, as far as the pragmatists were concerned, was to put forth the following proposition, which was that it was impossible for a finite organism to keep up with a multi-dimensionally transforming landscape, environmental landscape, let's say. And so the best that could be done was to generate random variants, kill most of them because they were wrong, and let the others that were correct enough live long enough to propagate, whereby the same process occurs again. So it's not like the organism is a solution to the problem of the environment. The, the organism is a very bad partial solution to an impossible problem. Okay, and the thing that the thing that about that is that 
you can't get outside that claim. Now, I can't see how you can get outside that claim if you're a Darwinian, because the Darwinian claim is that the only way to ensure adaptation to the uh, unpredictably transforming environment is through random mutation, essentially, and death. And that there is no truth claim whatsoever that can surpass that. And so then that brings me to the next point, if you don't mind, and then I'll shut up and let you and let you talk. Mm. So I was thinking about that, and I thought, thought about that for a long time. So it seems to me there's a fundamental contradiction between Darwin's claims and and the Newton deterministic claim and the and the materialist objective claim that science is true in some final sense. And so I was thinking of two things that I read. One was the attempt by the KGB back in the uh, in the late part of the 20th century to hybridize um, smallpox and Ebola and then aerosol it so it could be used on on you know for mass destruction and. The thing is, is that that's a perfectly valid scientific enterprise, as far as I'm concerned. It's an interesting problem. Um, you might say, well, you shouldn't divorce it from the surrounding politics. Well, that's exactly the issue, is how much it can be divorced, and then, and from what. And then the second example is, you know, a scientist with any sense would say, well, you know, our truths are incontrovertible. Let's look at the results, and we could say, well, let's look at the hydrogen bomb. You know, if if you want a piece of evidence that our theories about the subatomic structure of reality are accurate, you don't really have to look much farther than a hydrogen bomb. It's a pretty damn potent demonstration. And so then I was thinking, well, imagine for a moment that the invention of the hydrogen bomb did lead to the outcome, which we were also terrified about in the during the Cold War, which would have been, for the sake of argument, either the total elimination of human life or perhaps the total elimination of life. Now, the latter possibility is quite unlikely, but the former one certainly wasn't beyond comprehension. And so then I would say, well, the proposition that the universe is best conceptualized as subatomic particles was true enough to generate a hydrogen bomb, but it wasn't true enough to stop everyone from dying. And therefore, from a Darwinian perspective, it was an insufficient pragmatic proposition and was therefore, in some fundamental sense, wrong. And perhaps it was wrong because of what it left out. You know, maybe it's wrong in the Darwinian sense to reduce the complexity of being to um, a material substrate and forget about the surrounding context. So, well, you know, those are two examples. And so you can have a way at that if you want. Yeah, okay. So there are a few issues here that I think we need to pull apart. I think that the, the basic issue here and where I disagree with you is you seem to be equivocating on the nature of truth here. You're using truth in two different senses and finding a contradiction that I, that I don't in fact think exists. So let's talk about, about pragmatism and Darwinism briefly for a second. So I've spent a lot of time in the, the thicket of, of pragmatism because I was a student of Richard Rorty's at Stanford and I took every class he taught and just basically did nothing but argue with him about pragmatism. So I'm very familiar with this way of viewing the concept of scientific truth. I'm not so sure our audience is deeply schooled in this. So briefly, let me just add a little, little to how you describe pragmatism. And this is, you know, Rorty was one of the leading lights of pragmatism, as, as you know, so this, his view may be slightly idiosyncratic, but it was fairly well subscribed among pragmatists, and he was influenced by Dewey, and he linked his view in some similar ways to, to a Darwinian conception of truth. but not quite the way you're doing, it seems to me. In any case, the idea is that we can never stand outside of human conversation and talk about reality as it is, or truth as it is. We never, we never come into contact with naked truth. All we have is our conversation and our tools of augmenting our conversation, scientific instruments and otherwise. And 
all we really have, the, the currency of, of truth, is whatever successfully passes muster in a conversation. So I say something that I think is true, and it seems to work for you. We have a similar, we're playing a similar language game, and some people disagree. They criticize what we are, are claiming to be true, and we go back and forth. And all we ever have is this kind of ever expanding horizon line of successful conversations that allow us to do things technologically that are very persuasive. So as you say, we can build hydrogen bombs. And so the conversation about the structure of the atom, at the very least, the conversation about the amount of energy hidden in the otherwise nebulous structure of an atom, that becomes you know, very well grounded in facts that we, that we all can agree are, are intersubjectively true. Yeah, well, that seems, to, that seems to weaken the claim that it's just within language, you know, which is kind of a postmodern claim, too, because it's very difficult for me to believe that the hydrogen bomb is what it is just because we agree what it is in conversation. You know, it, Absolutely, it immediately yeah. reflects a world outside of, now, that outside of language. That doesn't mean we, we get permanent and omniscient access to that world, but, but it's more than language as far as, so maybe I'm misunderstanding Rorty or, or um, I think you're you are understanding him. He just he will say that again. All we ever have is our effort to organize the way the world seems to us with concepts and language, and we just have successful iterations of that and unsuccessful ones. And a hydrogen bomb explosion, no matter how big, assuming we survive it, still falls within this empirical context of an evolving language game. And I agree with you that this does, it does connect with postmodernism in a way that is decidedly unhelpful. And, and Rorty was a fan of Derrida and Foucault. And, you know, I remember walking out of Derrida's lecture at Stanford, I literally had to, to climb over the bodies of the credulous who were sitting in the aisles listening to the great man speak. And he didn't speak a single intelligible sentence, as far as I recall. Well, that's obviously just because you don't have the profundity to understand, uh, you know, a, a postmodern French neo-Marxist intellectual. I don't. But to get back to some of your claims here, there's this claim you're making about the Darwinian basis of truth and knowledge, that there really is just survival, right? There's just, you know, biological change selected against by an environment and there is what works in that context, what is pragmatic in that context biologically, and there's what doesn't, and what doesn't gets you killed. Yeah. Now, obviously, that picture of, of how we got here is something that I agree with. Right. But our conception of truth, and our conception of truth in general, and scientific truth specifically, and, and even of Darwinian evolution within that subset of truth claims, that is not functioning by merely... Darwinian principles, and this just goes to right, but that that could be an objection to its validity. Like, there's no reason to assume, and, and I, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm perfectly happy with science. I'm a scientist, and um, but there's no reason to assume that our our view of the world, our current scientific view of the world, isn't flawed or incomplete in some manner that will prove fundamentally fatal to us. As a working assumption, we can decide not to worry too much about that, and that's fine. But yes, I agree, and more fundamental than that, and I think this is the accurate version of the claim you're making. This is something that I, I spoke about on another podcast with Max Tegmark, a physicist from MIT. The, there is just the fact that within the Darwinian conception of how we got here, there's no reason to believe that our cognitive faculties have evolved to put us in error-free contact with reality. That's not how they evolved. I mean, we, we did not evolve to be perfect mathematicians or perfect logical operators or perfect conceivers of scientific reality at the very small, you know, subatomic level or at the very large cosmic level or at the very old cosmological level. We are designed by the happenstance of evolution to function within a very narrow band of, of light intensities and physical parameters. The things we are designed to do very well are, you know, recognize 
the facial expressions of apes just like ourselves and to throw objects in parabolic arcs within a hundred meters and, and all of that. And so right. the fact that we are able to succeed to the degree that we have been in creating a vision of scientific truth and the structure of the cosmos at large that radically exceeds those narrow parameters, that is a, it's a kind of miracle. It's an amazing fact about us that seems not to be true, remotely true, of any other species we know about. And that's, that's something to be celebrated, and it's a lot of fun to see how far we can get in that direction. But I would grant you that there are no guarantees as we move forward in that space. And in fact, we should be skeptical about how easy we can have it in this space. Yes. One thing that Max Tegmark said, which I thought was fascinating, he, he goes one step further than I had tended to go along these lines, where he said that we should expect, as just based on accepting the, the logic of evolution, we should expect that we will have our common sense intuitions frequently and really incessantly violated by what we discover to be true about the nature of reality through science. Yeah, what we discover scientifically to be yeah. true about the nature of reality. Yeah, well, so so partly I made the case that I made to indicate to you and the listeners where I'm starting from in some sense. So I think it's not unreasonable to assume that you're making the metaphysical claim in some sense that Darwinian truth is nested inside Newtonian truth. I wouldn't call it Newtonian. Let me just change your words a little bit, but it may be a distinction without a difference here. But I would oppose realism, scientific realism, and even moral realism. I consider myself a moral realist. I think there are right and wrong answers to moral questions. I would oppose realism with pragmatism. And the core tenet of realism yeah. for me is that it's possible for everyone to be mistaken. It's possible for there to be a consensus around truths that are, in fact, not true. It's possible to not know what you're missing. There's a horizon of cognition beyond which we can't currently see, and we may be right or wrong about what we think exceeds our grasp at the moment. And so that's, that's something that the pragmatist can't say. The pragmatist has to locate truth always within the context of existing conversations, existing consensus. And in this Darwinian conception of truth, you are saying that there is just what works for us biologically, pragmatically, as apes on Earth now, and there is nothing, there's no larger context of truth claims that we can make that situates that in a, in a larger sphere, where you can intelligibly say that everyone is wrong about something. Well, it's complicated, and I wouldn't say I'm saying exactly that. Um, I certainly don't agree with the language game part of it. Um, and see, if you if you think of the Darwinian process as something you can't escape, like there's no outside of it. And partly the reason for that is that you're just too damn ignorant to to get outside of it in any in any transcendent manner. Now you might say, well, you can do that to some degree with science, and I'm not going to argue with that. But, but before you move on, let me just understand the claim because. It seems to me we are outside of it in every respect where you want to emphasize the Darwinian component of it. So we're, we're outside of the implications that, you know, certain phenotypes would have killed you outright 5,000 years ago, whereas now we have a civilizational mechanism to protect those people. So if you're wearing eyeglasses and you, you are able to function just as well as your neighbor who's got perfect vision, you're out of a Darwinian paradigm there. It doesn't matter that you're wearing eyeglasses, right? On a thousand points, we can make that same observation. And therefore, more or less everything we care about has followed along those lines. I mean, so just the fact that we are, you know, one of the greatest gains we are attempting to make, although we, we have done it imperfectly thus far, is to outgrow tribalism in all its forms, right? So we, we recognize that tribalism is not the best you know, moral bedrock. And yet, in a Darwinian paradigm, tribalism is really the only game in town. And so we stand outside of Darwinian logic, both morally and intellectually, all the time now. Are you denying that? What am I confused about? I'm calling that into question. I'm, I'm not necessarily denying it, and I'm certainly not presuming that 
you know, that what I'm saying is right, because I'm trying to solve another problem at the same time. But you see, the thing about the scientific viewpoint is that it leaves certain things out. And it leaves out what it doesn't know, obviously, although the same might be said for any other system of belief and should be. But it also looks at the world in a particular way. For example, it strips the world of its subjectivity. And it may be that that's a fatal error. Now, that doesn't mean that it stopped science from being unbelievably useful as a tool. But I think of science as a tool rather than as a description of reality. And, you know, that's, well, that's where we differ. And, and it's f- fair that we differ. You know, it's, it isn't obvious which of those two positions could be held to be correct. Because, you know, you could say that the more we learn about the objective world, you know, in your realist manner, the higher the probability that we'll survive. And it's conceivable that those things are aligned in that manner. But it's also conceivable that they're not. And I'm uh, wary of that because radical changes produce unintended consequences. And, you know, we've lived relatively successfully as, as primates for, you know, a couple of dozen million years. And we're transforming things pretty damn rapidly. You know, I mean, one potential outcome is that in 500 years, we're more machine than human, you know, and that we're not really human at all in any realistic sense. And I can't necessarily see that as a, you know, you could claim that that's a positive outcome, but it isn't necessarily that it's a positive outcome. So you're you're assuming that there is an alignment between the two. No, I'm not doing that. And, I okay. think, and now I'm getting a little confused about what you're claiming. So let me just go over that ground you just sketched just to, to get myself on track. So it seems to me that you're saying that the reductio ad absurdum of a Darwinian conception of knowledge would be if we ever learned certain truths that got us all killed, well, then that would prove that these things weren't true or that this was an intellectual dead end. Yeah, they weren't true enough, I would say. I mean, two things here. One is that there's nothing about my conception of science that discounts the reality or the significance of subjectivity. So I I understand what you're saying when you say that science or materialism leaves out subjectivity. And that's, I've ridden that same hobby horse against that conception of science myself. So you won't find a friend of eliminative materialism in me. That's just not how I think about the human mind. Well, do you think that that's true of your views on consciousness? Because that's another place where I would say we radically disagree. Yeah, well, I, I don't know that you would you understand my views on consciousness if you think that, but we can get there. I think there is a subjective dimension of reality that is undeniable. In fact, and I've said, for instance, that consciousness is the one thing in this universe that can't be an illusion. It's the only thing that you can be absolutely sure exists at this moment, in the sense that... Uh, I actually like another claim that you make better that's, that's related to that. I think the one thing... And this is, I think, part of the, your fundamental ethical metaphysics, and it's a point on which we agree, I, I believe. You know, you, you are very concerned with, let's call it pain, for lack of a better word. And, you know, one of the conclusions that I've reached, which is, I think, in keeping with what you just said, because it, it, it necessarily involves consciousness. But So let's call consciousness a reality, but then I would say that the most undeniable form of consciousness is acute agony because no one doubts that not if you watch them act and that's one of the criteria by which i judge whether or not someone believes something you know so people if people act out something uncontrollably then i'm convinced that they believe it regardless of what they think they believe and so and i think it's for that reason that so many religious systems start with the same metaphysic, which is life is suffering. That's the ultimate reality. And that's, that's associated with consciousness, certainly. But it's, it's, it's more precise than that, you know, because maybe you can doubt whether you're happy, but it's very difficult to doubt that you're in agony and have that actually work. So yeah. people act as if that's the most real thing. And part of your ethical metaphysics, as far as I can tell, is 
you take that as bedrock in some sense and then say, well, whatever we do, we shouldn't go there. And, you know, there's, there's in a manner, in a way, the way that I think par- parallels that, except that you posit well-being as the um, opposite, let's say, of suffering. And this is, and this is something I really want to talk to you about, because I think there's a, there's a paradox in your thinking. And I could be wrong, but let, tell me what you think. Let's wait to get there, because this is a different topic. I, I definitely want to get okay. into morality okay. with you. Okay. And that's all, all ripe for discussion. But this conception of truth, I think we have to nail down, because it just seems to me undeniable that there are facts, whether or not any of us, any existing population of human beings, are aware of those facts. So before there was any understanding of the energy trapped in an atom, the energy was still trapped in the atom, right? And and the Trinity test proved that beyond any possibility of doubt. So prior to the you know the bomb going off at Alamogordo, you had the some of the world's best physicists not entirely sure what was going to happen. They had a an educated guess about what was going to happen. I think there was a there was a betting pool on the question of, of just how big the detonation would be. There were some people who thought that nothing would happen. They would actually fail to initiate a, a chain reaction. The point is, is that there was a kind of a probability distribution among the, the smartest people over the, the range of possible outcomes there. So this was a linguistically mediated conception of what was true at the level of the very, very small in physical reality. And we got more information once we saw that bright light and mushroom cloud. And now the conversation continues. But it seems to me that a realistic conception of what's going on there, and really the only sane one, if you look long enough at it, is that our language didn't put the energy in the atom. It's not because we spoke a certain way about it that that determined the character of physical reality. No, physical reality has a character whether or not there are apes around to talk about it. Okay, so look, look, everything you said there, I agree with. It. I guess my one, my one uh, objection to that is the, well, is it true enough objection? So, you know, in order to establish an objective fact, we have to parameterize the search. We have to narrow the search. We have to exclude many, many things. And I think sometimes when we do that, we end up generating a truth, and I would say it's a pragmatic truth that works within the confines of the parameters that have been established around the experiment. Mm. But then when launched up, off into the broader world, much of which was excluded from the theorizing, the results can be catastrophic. And I would say that's akin to the problem of there's operationalization, right, where where you reduce the phenomena to something that you can discover and discuss scientifically. And then there's generalization back to the real world. And one of the things that you see happen very frequently is that the operationalization succeeds, but the generalization is a catastrophe. That's very frequently the case with the application of social science theories to the world, okay, but, because but, they leave so much out. Okay, so let's, let's just focus on this claim or this concern about certain forms of knowledge or certain descriptions of the world leading to catastrophe. Now, I completely agree that that's possible, but it doesn't mean what you seem to think it means here. So it's possible for there to be scientifically correct, realistically true conceptions of the world that are bad for us. There are not many examples of that. I think, right, I think right. the utility of, of knowing what's going on is usually so high that it's better to know what's going on. But for instance, I mean, the, the example I occasionally use is there is a right way to synthesize the smallpox virus right now. Is this knowledge good for anyone to have? Well, perhaps at the CDC or in, in certain labs, we want to have this knowledge because it allows us to develop an inoculation against smallpox. It allows us to, to understand viral properties in ways that perhaps we wouldn't otherwise. I don't know. I don't do that work. But it seems to me to be objectively dangerous to play around with synthesizing smallpox. And 
this is not the kind of knowledge that you want to spread as far and as wide right, as possible. Right. Well, right, exactly. That's the parameterization and the generalization problem. That's precisely it. Okay, but to point out that this is dangerous, to point out that it would be irresponsible to spread this knowledge, to point out that in the wrong hands, this could be catastrophic and in fact could end the human experiment, right? Mm -hmm. The career of the species. So it could be very anti-Darwinian, to use your framing, yes. in a local sense with respect to Homo sapiens, because this could be the thing that kills all of us, right? Right. That's, yes, catastrophic, fine. But that doesn't undermine the scientific truth value of... But it undermines, I agree, but it, do, it does undermine the claim that scientific truth is the ultimate truth. That's the claim that it undermines. No, it doesn't undermine it epistemologically. It undermines it as something you want in your life, right? It undermines it in terms of its value to us as a species. If knowing what is true got you all killed, well, then that would be a truth that wouldn't be worth knowing, but it wouldn't make it less true, right? So if I say... Well, okay, so, well, that, okay, so that's, that's... Okay, so let's imagine for a moment. I understand what you're saying, and, and I don't see that there's any logical problem with it. But I would say that we're actually starting from different fundamental axioms. Like the fundamental axiom that I'm playing with is something that was basically expressed by Nietzsche. And it's a definition of truth. And so I would say if it doesn't serve life, it's not true. But that... but. So what, what we're arguing about is but what... I, okay, but Jordan, I have to pull the brakes there. I mean, I think that's... I agree morally, ethically, given my concern about the well-being of humanity. I agree with that as a moral starting point. We want to know what is worth knowing. We don't want to know everything, and we certainly don't want to know truths that will get us all killed or make us all needlessly miserable. Okay. We want good lives, right? Okay, so then I would say that you, by, by making that proposition... You've accepted the claim but no, that the scientific you, you, endeavor should be nested inside a moral endeavor. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I accept that claim. But Well, then it can't be then more then the moral endeavor can't be grounded in the scientific endeavor because the outside thing can't the inside thing can't ground the outside thing. It's logically not possible. I would disagree there, but so let's talk about that when we talk about morality, because I, yeah, I think okay. that's that's a great conversation to have. But here we're still we're getting bogged down on the concept of truth. I think you can't have a concept of truth that is subordinate to well-being. You want well-being, I will grant you that, and, and my definition of well-being is quite expansive, and it just remains to be discovered what in the end will conduce to the, the greatest flourishing of minds like our own and minds beyond our own. As you say, when we integrate ourselves with, with our supercomputers, who knows what beauty we'll experience and what meaning will be available to us. I'm interested in, in all of that, and I want, I want us all, all to survive, and I don't want to be annihilated by true facts that were dangerous to know. But, okay, so, but it seems to me then, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me, and, and believe me, this point I'm pushing is part of the reason that I got to where I got. It's exactly this issue, because I realized that it was necessary for, for our attitude towards science to be nested in something else, which was a higher moral conception. And if, if I'm not mistaken, you just made the claim that, you know, if there are scientific things that we could mess with that might destroy us all, it would be better if we didn't. Okay? Yes, but, but, but by what standard? We will get there, but, okay. but they will be no less true. You clearly have to have a conception of facts and truth that is possible to know, that exceeds what anyone currently knows, and exceeds any concern about whether it is useful or compatible with your own survival even, to know these truths. Okay, well then I would say that I don't think that facts are necessarily true. <laughs> so I don't think that scientific facts, even if they're correct from within the domain that they were generated, I don't think that that necessarily makes them true. And I know that I'm gerrymandering the definition of truth, but I'm doing that on purpose because I'm trying to nest truth within a Darwinian framework, which I think is a moral framework. And I think that your, the logic of your argument about morality is going to push you in the same direction, inevitably. You're choosing, following Nietzsche here, you're choosing to use the word true 
you're choosing to freight it with some moral concerns that will make it very difficult for people to understand what you mean and for you to understand what they mean when you use truth as a synonym for, as you just said, correct. A fact may be correct, but it's not true. Right. It seems to me this is, this is counterproductive, and you lose nothing by granting that the truth value of a proposition can be evaluated whether or not this is a fact worth knowing or whether or not it's dangerous to know. No, but that's the thing I don't agree with, because I, I think that that's the kind of conception of what constitutes a fact that does, in fact, present a moral danger to people, a mortal danger to people. And I also think that that's partly why the scientific endeavor, as it's demolished the traditional underpinnings of our moral systems, has produced an emergent nihilism and hopelessness among people that makes them more susceptible to ideological possession. I think it's a fundamental problem. And I do believe that the highest truths, let's put it that way, the highest truths are moral truths. I'm thinking of that from a Darwinian perspective. I want to get there with you because I, yeah, I think yeah. that that's the center of the bullseye, but we, we have to nail down some epistemology here. So I will state a few or things. Or even some ontology. Yeah. So I just want to make a few claims, which I think are unobjectionable, and I can see whether we're on the same page here. This is yeah. I'm going to probe you from my epistemology to yours. It seems to me that I can make statements about reality, which neither of us can judge to be true. We just don't have the tools or we're not going to take the time to do it. But we know there is a fact of the matter whether or not we can get the data in hand. So I could say, for instance, you have an even number of hairs on your body, right? Now, I don't know that that's true, but I, I know I have a 50% chance of being right about that. And this is not a non-binary possibility. This is a binary one, assuming you have any hair on your body. I'm not going to tell you either. Yeah, yeah. So, so presumably you don't know this about yourself. I don't want to envision what it would take to know that about oneself all the time. And in any case, it's susceptible to change. Now, what do you think about that? We don't know whether you have an even or odd number of hairs on your body. Well, I would agree with that, but I would say that the reason for that is that the, the definition of truth that you're using to make that statement true is nested inside the question itself. And I'll accept the definition and the question for the sake of pursuing that. We're outside of any kind of Darwinian imperative here. There's no reason to know this. You wouldn't be better off knowing this one way or another. You can do nothing with this knowledge. This is one reason you wouldn't seek the knowledge. But Right, but it won't hurt or kill me. And it's no less true. inside the Darwinian framework, and so I'm willing to go along with it. Okay, but let's say it could hurt or kill you. Let's say that, you know, now you're a hostage, and your hostage takers have a bizarre religion of their own invention, where they, they will kill people who have odd numbers of hairs on their body, and they will venerate people who have even numbers of hairs. So now your life depends on which is true about you. And perhaps, you know, if you have an even number of hairs, you, you want to find out. If you have an odd number, you don't, or you want to you find out only to then surreptitiously pluck one so that you can be now a, a safe member of this moral emergency. So nothing has changed with respect to truth value about the claims we might make about the hair on your body, right? It's just a different situation. Your concept of truth can't be hostage to these superficial changes in context. I think it's inevitably hostage to them. I don't think you can help it be hostage to them. I think that even the choice of what you're interested in is, as a scientist is subject to contextual factors that are, that are part of the parameters within which you, when you ask the question. Jordan, what does that mean in this context? So I'm talking, again, this is, is a bizarre example that just... You know, it may seem strange to talk about for any length, but I think it reveals, at the very least, an awkward commitment to revising our language. I think what it means technically is that the only final way of sorting out whether a scientific claim is sufficiently true is through Darwinian means. Because I think that the Darwinian process is the only way of adjudicating truth. Now, you don't, you don't accept that, and that's fine. I mean, it's not like what you're doing isn't coherent. 
I'm just confused at this point. It's not that I don't accept it. It's just I don't see how you can accept what you sound like you, you want to accept here. So you just agreed that if I were to assert that you have an even number of hairs on your body, I would be making a truth claim, which one, I'm clearly not qualified to make, but it's basically a coin toss bet. You know, it's analogous to my saying, the coin you just flipped and haven't revealed to me came up heads. It's an importantly similar claim to that. If I'm a rational person, it's a, a truth that I would assert only probabilistically. I, I have a 50% confidence that I'm right here. I will not be surprised to be right, and I won't be surprised to be wrong. And it seems to me that you're now claiming that this changes totally if someone comes into your office with a gun and says, I'm going to kill you if the coin came up heads, or I'm going to kill you if you have an odd number of hairs on your body. No, what your situation there, has changed. What changes there is that in the one situation, it's a really stupid game to be playing. And, and I'm not being, I'm not being uh, uh, what would you call it, dismissive making that argument. It's like, see, what you're doing is that you're taking a, uh, a way of looking at the world and you're making a, a micro example out of it. And you're saying that within the context of that micro example, uh, truth is not malleable by situation. It's like, okay, I buy it. But the problem is, is that micro example isn't separate in the actual world from the macro examples, which would be, let's call it the scientific method as such. And there may be local applications of the scientific method where the local facts generated are sufficiently uh, you know, context independent so that you can't make any contextual claims. But I could say, well, well, it turned out in a thousand years that that entire empirical game was fatal. And so then I would say, well, the micro parts of it were fatal, too. You just couldn't see it. I agree about the the non-utility of playing fatal games, right? So we, we don't want to play games that will get us all killed reliably, certainly if there's no huge benefit on the, the well, other side. Well, from a scientific perspective, why not? But then you're just saying that is there a scientific reason to want to exist or to want your kids to live happy lives as opposed to die in their sleep tonight. Yes, that is partly what I'm saying, yes. We can talk about that, but it seems to me we can't just skip over this question of truth because it anchors everything else we, any other well, claim I, we're well, going to make. Well, no, well, but another thing to do would, you know, look, fair enough, and we could argue about it for quite a while. And I think the problem, the danger is, is that we'll sidetrack the entire conversation doing this and that that won't be so useful. So what I would recommend is um, that we could recognize for the moment that we're starting with different claims of truth. But, but I don't think we are. I, th I think you're, you're simply deciding at the end of the day to say that any truths that led us down a path where we suffered unnecessarily or died weren't true right you have to choose what you mean by true you have to and i'm not accepting the the same definition of truth that you operate under because and it's partly because i believe that darwin trumps realism let's say i believe that pragmatism trumps realism but even the truth of darwinism is not anchored to a Darwinian conception, in your view, of truth, it's anchored to a realistic one. So Darwinism will not prove to be false if knowing about Darwinism gets us all killed. That's entailed in your claim. Darwinism would bite its own tail there and disappear. Well, not necessarily, not necessarily, because our conception of Darwinian evolutionary processes could be flawed as well, and probably is. I mean, the recent developments in... That goes without saying. Yes, we do not have a complete scientific picture of reality, but if evolution is true in any sense, if cosmic rays initiate point mutations in genomes and you get genetic diversity on the basis of that and things get selected for based on regularities in the environment and you get speciation, if any of that is true, if DNA has any connection to heritability, right? We have good reason to believe 
that we are on unusually solid ground there, modulo all of the, the things we don't yet know about biology, if any of it's true, it's not true in this sense that you are describing Darwinian truth. Let's just stipulate that knowing all that about ourselves, knowing about evolution, knowing about molecular biology, in 25 years, that will allow us, based on perverse social changes that are kindled by that self-knowledge and technological breakthroughs, synthetic biology that are empowered by it, we will annihilate ourselves. If Martians came down and had to assess what went on here, the honest description of what happened is we have a species of apes that understood something about evolution, and it was fatal to them. Let's just say yeah. that's true. Okay, if that's true on your analysis, we would then have to say that evolution wasn't true. No, we'd have to say our theory of evolution wasn't true. But if you then went had to look at the ways in which it was false, yeah. you wouldn't be able to find any way it was false up until the moment it killed us. Oh, that's possible. That's possible. Um, and, you know, I think you're making a subtle a subtle and, and, and useful point. I mean, because you're, you're playing with the idea of nesting again. It's like Darwin, Darwinian theory nested in a realistic worldview, or is it the other way around? And, you know, you're making the claim that the Darwinian theory is a variant of realism theories. It's a good claim. But it has to be this way because just imagine two counterfactual situations. Well, it, okay, here's a way that it might not be true. It might be that the world of selects, let's call reality that which selects. And so let's say that our scientific theories bear some approximation to a description of that which se selects, and then that informs our Darwinian theory. Those could all be in sufficient error so that they're fatal. You know, I, th and I think, see, when I think of, of re reality, see, you think of reality, that I believe, this is, this is what I meant, meant by a Newtonian view, you think of the world like a, of reality, like a materialist realist. And, and I think of reality as that which selects. And those things aren't the same because the materialist realist description of that which selects is very insufficient. And that insufficiency undermines the accuracy of our Darwinian knowledge. So I guess the only way I can respond to what you said is that I would say that if our knowledge of Darwin, <laughs> of the evolutionary process was true, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't it wouldn't be fatal. Now, that, that's a strange claim, and I'm not sure that it's true, but, but, but I think it might be. I think that, because it's, let's say that our theory of, of, of the genesis of life and the genesis of the world and all of that became comprehensively accurate, comprehensively accurate, I would say that we would find that would give us a place in the world that would bolster our probability of surviving rather than undermining. And I guess that's partly because, you know, and this is another claim of faith, I suppose, but, you know, when we're starting to me mess around with the definition of fact and true, you get down to the place where you have to make axiomatic presuppositions. You know, I would say that reality is not opposed to our existence. Let's... I need to break in here, Jordan, because I just think you're not noticing the price you are paying for redefining a word like truth. And, you know, ironically, it's probably even a steeper price than what these gender pronoun maniacs are attempting to pay for asking that everyone use their favorite word to describe their identity. Truth is a bedrock conception it's not just a scientific one, it's a journalistic one, it's a, an interpersonal one, and it is a... Okay, good, good. Well, let's, let's flip to that. It's that to which our very sanity is anchored, and I think you, well, you tug okay, at this but, anchor at your peril. Right, definitely. Believe me, I, I'm perfectly aware of that. It's, it's, it's put me in peril many times, but I would also point out that people were getting along just fine without an empirical conception of the world for millions and millions of years, and animals still manage it. So they're obviously operating 
on some level of representation of reality that doesn't require articulated empirical investigation. It's possible to survive without having a, a clear notion of truth, but it's probably not possible to be reliably understood in a conversation about scientific reality or the relationship between mind and matter or anything else that we're trying to talk about here. And so let me just point out a few things. It seems to me what you're doing here is you are marrying the concept of truth, which is a, an epistemological one, also to the concept of goodness. And maybe, maybe you want to freight it even more with the concept of beauty. You're going to fuse truth and goodness and perhaps even beauty together as this kind of jewel that can't be spoken about in its terms of its separate parts because they are fused now. But this creates a few problems. So, for instance, you, if you are going to talk about truth as being inseparable from goodness and goodness being a matter of what happens in the end, but we never really reach the end necessarily. We just, we're just moving forward in time. So what happens here is we'll have all of these descriptions of reality and ways of talking about it and things we can do technologically on the basis of these, this advancement in our conception of things. All of that can be going forward quite nicely. All of it can seem true and beneficial and tending toward the good. But then something happens, which on the basis of what we know and, and what we perhaps only dimly understand, just winds up killing us, right? And then what you now have to do is go back in time and say all of the things we had good reason to believe were true weren't because of this, this fatal episode at the end. And then if you had another, a separate population of people who believed all the same things, but because of some contingent difference in their situation, those truths, now in scare quotes, those truths didn't wind up killing them, but they went on to flourish perfectly by their light. Well, then I would say that the, conting the contingent difference that you're describing would be significant. It's clearly significant for their survival, but how can it be significant for the truth? I mean, it could be just as... I don't accept, I don't accept the proposition that a contingent event that wasn't related to definitions of the truth could produce the divergent outcome that you but I, propose. But I just gave you one. I mean, granted, it's a well, cockamamie so I, example, I, but it's... Yeah, I know, but that's the problem. Take my terrorist. We could put you in a situation where knowing something or not knowing something would get you killed. And yet, the fact that it would get you killed doesn't reach into the, the truth value of the statement. If there's someone going around Toronto killing people for not being able to name all the U.S. presidents in sequence. And let's say he's wrong about what the sequence is. So if you give him a sequence that is, in fact, inaccurate, that is untrue, but it works for him and you survive, it doesn't make it true. Right? I mean, you, you need a concept of truth that flows three. It, it makes it true enough to survive. Yes, it makes it useful. It's a good thing you got the wrong sequence, but we yes, still... Yes, well, I did, I did tell you at the beginning that I was a pragmatist nested in Darwin, Darwinism. And I, look, and I've got a, one more thing here. You know, you, you dragged me down this pathway claiming that I'm going to run into all sorts of trouble by conflating truth and beauty and goodness. But you're doing exactly the same thing when you claim that there can be a scientific basis for morality. You're just inverting the, you're just inverting the causal order. I'm doing it from a pragmatic perspective, and you're doing it from a scientific perspective. But it's not pragmatic. Well, I think it is, because I don't think that you can come up with a moral conception that isn't pragmatic. You think you can, but I don't think you can. So, and, 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 like, and I'm, I'm not, it's not like you don't put your arguments forward with, with power and coherence. It's, they're powerful arguments. And I'm not saying that I'm right. You are saying that you're right in the sense that you're not persuaded by the argument here. It seems to me that you have to grapple with this. Or at the very least, I need to move forward knowing exactly what you're claiming here. And I, I don't believe that I do. So I just want to come back to this example that I just stumbled upon, which seems to me to get at the issue nicely. If you were in a situation where someone asked you to rattle off the sequence of U.S. presidents, and you rattled it off, you know, swapping a, a, the order of a few, but that were the perfect order to keep you alive because now you're in the hands of some evil genius who himself is confused about the order of U.S. presidents and he will kill you if, you if your order is divergent from his, well then it seems to me that you have to be able to say that that was useful, right? You survived. But in fact, 
the order you have of U.S. presidents is wrong. It was wrong, but useful. The flip side is also true. I'm perfectly willing to say that. But I said already that you can set up micro examples where the claim that you're making is valid, but I'm not concerned with the micro examples. I'm concerned with the macro examples, the totality of the of the theory of fact and truth. The macro example is no different. So if we have a if we take the macro example where you take all of molecular biology and all of science and all of human history summating to a moment where some nefarious person synthesizes smallpox on the basis of an accurate understanding of how to do that, not an inaccurate yeah. one, right? Accuracy here is just a, a fudge okay, word I for truth. I would say that our science was insufficient insofar as it didn't manage to deal with the fact that we have nefarious scientists. Sure, sure, it's insufficient. Right, that's for, a big problem. Okay, it's a big so problem. You say, it's you the biggest say problem. that's factually true, and I would say, yeah, it's factually true insofar as it goes, but it wasn't sufficiently true to solve a fatal problem, which would be the problem of the nefarious scientists. So it was deeply flawed despite its local applicability. Deeply flawed in its, let's say, the way we used it morally. We didn't know enough to correct for human stupidity. Right, exactly. Yes, yeah, so we exactly. want to know more. That's it. Exactly. But none of its falsity migrates back to the biology that described smallpox. You can't then say, well... Sure, I could. I can say, well, you shouldn't have been looking at the biology of smallpox. Sure. You should have been solving the problem of nefarious scientists. Okay, but that's just to say that certain truths weren't worth knowing, or they were dangerous to know, or dangerous in the wrong hands. But what you seem to have been saying, and now I, I feel like we may be seeing dry land here, what you seem to have been saying, which I think you probably are not saying or don't want to say, is that... The conception of truth local to the smallpox virus has to be rewritten there because it turned out not to be useful. It turned yes. out to be fatal to us. Yes, and it's partly because of the narrowness of the... This is what I point I was making with the damn KGB. It's like, yeah, you know, they, they managed to synthesize uh, Ebola and smallpox, thus demonstrating the scientific truth of their effort. Well, okay, fine, but how about if we take the context into account? Perhaps we're ignorant, even scientifically, but more so morally, in such a profound way that while we go chasing those contingent scientific truths, we miss something really large and obvious, like true or not, um, generating a hybrid of smallpox and Ebola is, you know, let's call it ill-advised. And so... See, this is this is the point that I'm making is that But everything turns on that. Let's call it ill advised. I'm I'm with you there, right? So again, there are things that are not worth knowing. There are things that are dangerous to know. There are things that we'll never know and wish we could know, but we could be surprised about the consequences of knowing them and they could turn out to kill us in the end, right? I mean, so every variant of that is possible to say, which is to say true, but our concept of the truth value of any given statement can't be held hostage to its ultimate result for the survival of the species in the end. Yes, I, I think it can. That's where we disagree. I could be sitting in a room in my house and say, well, there's no fire in this, in this room, and the rest of the house could be on fire. And it's factually true that there's no fire in this room, but as a theory, it's a pretty stupid one. That's just an incomplete and a consequentially incomplete description of your situation. But you're when you well, that's exactly my point, though. That's exactly my point. But it was still true to say that there was no fire in your room. The fire was outside your room. It's a it's yeah, well, a it truth was, that doesn't get you true, anything. It was true, nested in a larger truth of falsehood, because the relevant issue is: is there a fire around that's going to kill me? If I say, well, there's no fire in this room, well, I suppose that's trivially true. But I would say I've certainly adopted a dopey framework of reference within which to ask that question. So again, this is this is something we can understand. You were asking the wrong question, or there was a better question to That's ask. That's the issue. Well, so I would say, look, here's another way of, of thinking about it. Um, insufficiently moral people will ask deadly scientific questions. Sure. Okay, but Jordan, honestly, that is a different topic. I mean, that's I completely agree. 
the reason why your conception of truth here is so unhelpful is because you'll, you'll continually be buffeted back and forth between good and bad outcomes, and your, your notion of scientific truth will be rewritten and overwritten and rewritten again in the process needlessly. So again, to take smallpox as an example, the same conception of smallpox, true or not, let's say true to you know, a first approximation, allows us to cure babies who get the disease or stop other babies from getting it. And it also allows us to synthesize it and kill everyone. It's the same description of reality. And so you have to say in the one case, your epistemology requires you to sit around counting dead babies, right? No, it, no, no, it doesn't. It, re it requires, so let's say, fine, I'm perfectly willing to go along with that particular example, then I would say, well, that's a very dangerous tool. And then we should bloody well make sure that the people who are wielding it have the wisdom to do so. And so like one of the things that I learned from reading Carl Jung, for example, was that his claim was that we're technological giants and moral, moral infants. And that, that's a really bad, that's a really bad, uh, what would you call it, combination. Mm -hmm. And so sure. the moral issue starts to become paramount. And of course, you also believe that to some degree because you're trying to. Yes, exactly. But so, don't but, you see how that's a different topic? That's the thing that I just can't get past here. Because if we were to say that smallpox is not a virus, it's a, a multi-celled organism that's getting people sick, right? That's our conception of it, right? And presumably we would be quite wrong at any point in human history to have formed that conception, right? But it was certainly possible to have thought that for a good long time. That is, we can make that distinction whether or not we, a hundred years from now, annihilate ourselves with a proper understanding of the smallpox virus. Well, I already admitted, as far as I can tell, that you can make microclaims that okay, that but it's justify all it's all viewpoint, just microclaims until the I'm, end of time. That's not what I'm right? talking so about. Just, it's all no, no, it's not. It's not at all microclaims because there's a there's a like the scientific the materialist realist perspective is a kind of ethic and it 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 it, it governs how people look at the world. It's a philosophy. It's a massive philosophy. It's a framework of reference. It's not, it's not a, an aggregation of micro-events, although it is also that. And I would say that the prob part of the problem with the scientific worldview as it's currently constituted is that it doesn't, it doesn't provide a reliable guide for the development of the kind of wisdom that would allow us to use our technology like grown-ups. You had me at wisdom. Of course, that is okay. So that then is the next true. thing I would say, well, and here's another thing: it's an enormous that, problem. But but again, okay. that, that is a, in my view, that is a change of topic. I mean, I think we should get on to that topic. Well, it's a change of scale, anyways. But it's not really because. So again, this is why I say it's all microclaims. We have all of these microclaims about reality, and this extends to every branch of science and mathematics. But it also extends to just ordinary facts, like the fact that you and I are talking on Skype now. Now, that is true, as far as I can tell. It's the only way I was attempting to talk to you, and I, I see the Skype logo on my computer. But this is a claim about which I could be right or wrong, and the rightness or wrongness of the claim is not going to be adjudicated by whether or not we survive another million years as a species. And you take the functionally infinite number of microclaims like that, and you carry them forward in time, and you build technology on their basis. And yes, this whole effort can be wisely guided or not, but whether it's wisely guided or not does not change the factual legitimacy of any one of those claims that has preceded your yes, ultimate... It might, because it, yes, it might, because it might highlight what they left out. Because it's like the claim, your claim about Skype is a local claim, you know, and, and as a local claim, I would say as a pragmatist, it's, it's, it's directly the case, but it's also grounded in a metaphysic. And so is the technology. And so... But Jordan, whether you leave something out, there are all kinds of things we can leave out. First of all, we will always be leaving something out. But second of all, we can leave things out that are worth knowing, that would 
add to our well-being and survival. We can leave things out that have absolutely no value one way or the other, negative or positive, but are still nonetheless true. And we can leave things out that we should leave out because they would be dangerous to know. Now, we need a concept of truth that allows us to make statements like that. But your concept of truth is collapsing everything back to whether we survive. Right. Presumably whether, whether, whether we survive doing. happily, right? No, just whether or not we survive. There are things that are worse than not surviving. We could survive in a way where everyone has a life that's not worth living. Okay, well, that would be bad, too. I would agree. We could create a, a kind of prison planet for ourselves where everyone gets tortured as long as possible, even the torturers, and nobody likes it. Yes, well, I would say that the probability that that game would sustain itself for very long is low. You know, it would probably degenerate. Hell, you know why hell is a bottomless pit, right? It's because no matter how bad it is, you can always make it worse. And so I would say a situation like that would either improve or it would, you know, spiral down to the ultimate end, which would be fatal. My point is that, that survival isn't the only value, right? It's certainly not, you could argue it's not even the, the deepest value. In the moment you form a conception of a life that would be worse than not living at all, it seems to me that you have trumped mere survival. You can easily imagine a situation where you would say of, your, of the person you love most in the world that they would be better off dead, right? That, I think, a morally and factually an intelligible claim, given the possibilities of human suffering, and given that there are certain situations where there is no remedy other than death. So even survival as an anchor here seems a somewhat whimsical one, but it's one that, granted, it has a direct connection to Darwinian evolution, because the survival of an organism is crucial, at least up to a certain point, is crucial to whether or not it gets its genes into the next generation. But again, I, I just think it's so obvious that you need to be able to say, you need to be able to use the word true and false and not continually have to dance around this freighted meaning and, and swap in synonyms like accurate or correct. And you just have to acknowledge that, that something can be true and dangerous. I would say it's objectively true, as far as our scientific theories are accurate at this time, in this local context. Okay. And that's, and that's as far as I'm willing to go. And, 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 you know, there are other reasons for this. Like, I'm perfectly aware of the pit that this produces and, and all of the complexities that it, that it uh, entails, but I'm not so sure that you're aware and, and I don't mean this as an insult by any stretch of the imagination, I'm not so sure that you're aware of the consequences of the rational, realist ethic that you're putting forth in your books, because I would say that they produce um, cognitive complexities that are at least as serious as the ones that you pointed out with my position. Let's move on there with the proviso that I think we are impressively capable of, of misunderstanding one another well, we're, moving we're forward. Definitely, but... Well, we're definitely disagreeing. I think you understand me, and I think... I... I don't think we are disagreeing. I think you are committed to elevating the concept of truth, or what you imagine to be elevating it, into this kind of the, the moral stratosphere, where it, it entails yes, goodness. That, that is... That is precisely and exactly what I'm doing. There's no doubt about it. But the problem with that is that then it makes it very difficult to talk about ordinary truth claims and to acknowledge that now you have a situation where your conception of factual accuracy either has to completely break apart from your conception of truth or it itself is continually vulnerable to changes in human history which could happen in, in a million years. When do we finally get to cash this check epistemologically? Let's say we survive for a million years. I don't know if we ever get to cash it. That's the problem with the Darwinian perspective, is that you're never right. You're only sufficiently right to go ahead. Okay, but all of those differences in sufficiency matter hugely, right? So if your kid gets sick and you go to the hospital and the doctor says, we have no idea what's wrong with your child. That's one situation, just a stark confession of ignorance, right? 
Now, for most of human history, there was obviously no hospital to go to. And if, if you had gone to anyone and said, why is my kid sick? You would get either a stark confession of ignorance or some crazy idea, the utility of which, you know, psychologically we might want to debate, but it would have nothing to do with the biological reality of why your kid was sick. Now, that ignorance through a lot of hard work gets overcome in a very piecemeal way and, and to no one's real satisfaction yet. But there's no question that we have made progress in our conception of human disease. For instance, the germ theory of disease. Knowing something about that has been very useful. Now, Sure, but along with that has come our ability to produce the hydrogen bomb and the birth control of course. pill and all sorts of other things that could easily be fatal. If somebody writes down a hundred-digit number in front of you and it ends in a one, and they say, this number is prime, and what is more, it's the largest prime number any human being has ever consciously beheld, right? That is either true or false, and its truth or falsity has absolutely nothing to do with the ultimate survival of the species or your personal well-being. I know, well, that's what you think. I understand that perfectly well, but I don't agree. <laughs> but your non-agreement hasn't... I would say it's, it's sufficiently true for all uh, likely contexts that are to arise in the next while. And, but the problem is, is that it's based in a metaphysics that might be fundamentally flawed in a way that we don't know that would turn out to be extraordinarily dangerous. Jordan, it could continually change because, again, this check never gets finally cashed unless everyone I dies. I know. Well, that's part of the Darwinian problem. Imagine riding these waves where the society becomes better and worse and better and worse and then much, much better and then much, much worse, all with this prime number claim running right through it, right? On the upslope, you'll say, oh, it's looking more and more true. It's looking more and more sufficient. And then on the downslope, you'll say, oh, well, that's fatally flawed. There's a lot we weren't considering. No, you, no, no. You'd have to draw a causal connection between the two. Like the relationship between that tiny little claim and the total underlying metaphysic is pretty tenuous. And so I'm not going to, you know, act as if a claim about a particular prime number is the causal fact in you know, rising civilizations up and down. I'm not making that claim. I'm making the claim that there's a metaphysic underneath that claim, and it could well play a causal role in those rises and okay, falls. But it doesn't play a causal role in adjudicating the question about whether or not that number is prime. Well, that's where I suppose that's where we get back to some degree to the problem of, of Rorty and these language game issues. It's like there's some rules that the game of prime numbers follows. We'll call it a game. And according to the rules of the game, that is a reasonable move. You know, and that's kind of how Wittgenstein conceptualized the meaning of words. You know, he thought about those as tools. And so I would say, well, if I accept the underlying claims of the mathematical game in which that's a reasonable proposition, then yes, that's true. It's the only way you can talk about a prime number. And sure, that's fine. And it might be useful to talk about prime numbers. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're true in the way that I'm defining truth, which you already pointed out is associated with something like wisdom or, or goodness. Like it might not, it's possible that it's not the sort of game a wise person would play. Now, I'm not saying that. Sure. I'm not saying that that's necessarily the case. No, but again, I just don't see how that could be relevant. That is a separate claim, which is intelligible to me, and it's perfectly worth talking about. In fact, it's, it's essential to talk about because there's an infinite number of things we could be paying attention to, and some will get That's us killed. It. That's it. There we go. That's part of the problem. So why are we paying attention to the things that we're paying attention to? Great. And that puts you in the moral domain immediately. Exactly. But another question is, why do scientists choose to study the things that they study? And then you might say, well, because it attracts their interest. And then you might say, why? And I would say, uh oh, now you're back into the dimension of the morality that surrounds science. But your concern about the misappropriation of human intelligence and science and culture, albeit totally valid and a concern I share, that is causing what you're doing with it, based on it sounds like Nietzsche, is causing you to engage in a kind of 
potlatch with your scientific tools. You are now vitiating the utility of being able to say things like a prime number is prime, whether or not any of us have figured that out. And in fact, whether or not there are people around who even have, understand the concept of prime numbers. Well, I would say that that's true within, that's true within a set of implicit axioms. It's true within a set of underlying presuppositions. If you accept the presuppositions, then it's true. Sure, but, but... But the presuppositions go really, 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 really deep. Yes, but you have to accept that presupposition whether or not we all die next Tuesday. No, I don't. You can't wait around for next Tuesday on the cusp of death to finally Why not? We make your epistemology we indelible. Do, no, we do that all the time. You know, there's a scientific theory that everybody says, oh, it's true. It's true. The theory of ether, that's a good one. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. Uh oh, didn't account for this. Well, I guess it wasn't true, even though we thought it was all along. That happens all the time. Of course, but it doesn't happen on the basis of a single variable, which is whether or not enough people survive. I mean, forget about the fact that this, ver this Darwinian criterion. No, we're willing to rewrite the history of what's true based on far less evidence than that. And that's a good thing. But, you know, you say yourself, well, science is always prone to correction by the discovery of errors in the future. So I don't see why that's any more radical than what I'm claiming. The errors have to be relevant and causally connected to the thing you're talking about. Our mere survival, and again, there are vagaries here. Then the question is, as I said before, survival for what? If you're surviving only to be immiserated, we could call that into question. But then there's the question of whether enough people survive, right? So like how many deaths would begin to erode our confidence in the primeness of a given number, right? 500 years ago. You're forced to rewrite our intellectual history based on a single criterion, whether it terminates in bliss or death. That just doesn't make any sense. I mean, we're going around and around on well, this I topic. Don't see, I don't really see how that's any different than your claim that science should be nested inside the search for well-being. Now we will move on to that because I think, okay. I, I know you want to get there, but I just need to plant a flag here. I think many people listening to this, I'll be interested to see what, if people have a similar reaction here, but I would expect many people will share my frustration that you're not granting what seem to be just fairly obvious and undeniable facts, and now we're, we're having to use this concept of truth in a pretty inconvenient way, right? Because it's, I don't see how anyone's going to think that it makes sense. That, that... No, look, fine. I, I, of course, it's going, to be, it's, going to be, it's going to be controversial. I mean, the claim I'm making is that scientific truth is nested inside moral truth. And moral truth is the final adjudicator. And your claim is, no, moral truth is, is nested inside scientific truth. And scientific truth is the final adjudicator. It's like, fine, you know, those are both coherent positions. But yours actually isn't coherent, because you're then having to, once we get into the fine print, you're having to say, well, of course, all of those micro instances, the billions upon billions of which can be cited, don't get changed based on whether or not we survive. You seem to be having it both ways. I point you to a micro instance, you say, well, that's just a micro instance isolated from everything else. But the moment I connect it to everything else, you seem to suggest that it's going to change. But the mechanism by which it would change, I mean, there, there is no causal connection between... Well, let, let's look at it this way. Look at it this way. So let's take the Irish elk as an example. So one of the things that happened to the Irish elk, we think, because he went extinct, was that sexual selection sort of got out of control and the females fixated on antler width and the poor damn elk ended up with like a 12-foot rack. And that didn't, you know, this is obviously a post hoc theory, but sexual selection can account for runaway transformations like that. And the poor elk got a rack so big that it really wasn't commensurate with his survival. Although this, uh, then we might say, well, I guess there was something wrong with what the female elk decided to focus on, but we didn't really know that till we went extinct. And I see that as precisely analogous to the point that I'm making right now. We're concentrating on certain things in a certain way, and it's a scientific way, let's say which is flawed and insufficient, although very powerful. And it, it needs to be subordinated to something else. Well, of it course. Must be, or it will be fatal. I can grant all of that. Again, there are, certain, there are certain ways of paying attention that are dangerous, right? There are certain things that we shouldn't be doing 
which we're tempted to do. Right. And I think one of those things is defining the world as in a materialist, realist terms. I happen to think that. And I have my reasons. But this clearly, the utility, the pragmatism of behaving in certain ways or spending our time in certain ways or thinking in certain ways has to break free of a conception of whether or not certain things are true. That's the only way you can make a claim that there are certain things that are in fact true that are dangerous to know. There's no way for you to say that. On this Darwinian conception, you would just have to say, well, no, then, then they're not true. If they're dangerous to know, they're not true. But there's so much that is yeah, in, inconvenient of, about changing, framing it that way. That, yeah, I know that it's true. Of course there is. There are, there are equal inconveniences with framing it the opposite way. We're not going to get rid of inconveniences. It's like, you know, you, you're criticizing my perspective and you're doing it quite effectively. Although I don't think fatally, because I think my distinction between the micro situation and the metaphysics stands. But I would say that, that that's not exactly the issue. The issue is, can you offer an alternative that has fewer metaphysical problems? And I would say no. I would say that your counterposition produces just as many annoying paradoxes and complexities as my position does. Certainly that remains to be discovered, but it's, again, I just... This is no doubt a flaw of mine as an, an interlocutor, but this is the kind of thing that does just drive me nuts. And I, I just want to make it, one... Well, it should. <laughs> I want to make it one should. more pass. It drove me nuts, too. For the philosophers in the audience, I'll make one more pass. Just entertain this example. So you have okay. two labs that are studying the smallpox virus, and they both have the, the same conception of the smallpox virus in hand. They both are working with the same tools. They've got the same physical tools, the same intellectual tools. One lab weaponizes it and kills 500 people based on some motive that we would obviously want to criticize. And the other lab creates a vaccine and immediately saves the same number of lives. Now, they both have the same description of smallpox rattling around in their brains. No, they don't, because otherwise one wouldn't have weaponized it. You're expecting me to assume the initial propositions, which is these labs are identical except for the outcome. It's like, no, they're not identical, because the outcome would be identical then. So, so you know, it's kind of like Joshua Green's uh, moral, moral story. I can fix this. I can fix this. Let's just, let's not go to Green yet. Then the the difference between the two labs is not a difference in their motives, right? We're not, it's not good people in one lab and the opposite in another. There's just some trivial difference in their equipment or just good and bad luck, which causes one to accidentally let this virus leak out and kill people and causes the other to successfully produce a vaccine. Whenever you ask members of these labs what smallpox is and what they're trying to do, they say the exact same sentences but we okay. have a different outcome. Okay, well, that's a whole different issue, though, because then they're not weaponizing it. They just made a mistake. Yeah, they made a mistake, but it, they were playing around with smallpox, and it was highly unpragmatic, given the fact that people immediately died. And if the other lab hadn't produced its vaccine, everyone could have died. So here we've got two linked conditions that share the same epistemology. They've got the same truth claims about smallpox. One is inadvertently killing people, highly non-Darwinian, non-pragmatic on your account. The other is saving people and, in fact, is the only bulwark against the consequences of the ineptitude in the first lab, right? Okay, well, okay, fine. You know, first of all, I don't think it's a very good example because it only involves the death of a few people, but let me, let me counter with a real-world example. No, 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 don't change the example. Scale it up. Let's say we're... Okay. They're killing half of humanity and the other lab is saving as quickly as they can, the remaining half of humanity. Okay, well, what would happen? Give me your sure. conception of truth to describe what's happening here. See, you're binding it again. And because you, you say, well, one is exactly the same of, as the other, except there's a, there's a snake in one. There was a hole in somebody's glove, right? Whatever, you could make okay. it as trivial as you want. Sure, how about if we make it that the engineers didn't check the damn O-rings carefully enough so the Space Challenger blew up? Okay, so what would happen in a situation like that? Well, what would happen would be that there would be a tremendous investigation into the cause of the error, and there would be moral, uh, part of that investigation would be a moral investigation. Were people being 
blind? Were they being careless? Were they following proper procedure, etc.? So the the first thing that would happen is that people would assume that there were genuine reasons in motivation that might have caused it. Now, they wouldn't have been among the scientists necessarily. They might have been among the equipment suppliers. And so we might say, well, maybe that piece of equipment happened to be made by slaves in China, and they weren't too concerned with its quality. And so then we might say, well, you know, maybe that throws the whole uh, moral validity of the Chinese system into, into doubt. And so that little mistake in the lab that you're describing that has this horrible consequence ends up tied up into all sorts of other things. But it need not be. Grant me the possibility of a little mistake that allows for smallpox to get carried home on somebody's briefcase and spreads an epidemic. It's obvious that this is possible. This is the kind of thing well-intentioned people guard against working in those labs all the time. Well, then I would say that that was evidence that the moral notion that mucking about with smallpox was a bad idea. Except in this case, you can't say that, and you certainly can't link bad idea to the epistemological truth value of our understanding of smallpox. Well, I think you I think you can. We have the other lab on the other side of the earth by the only possible method we, available to us producing the vaccine that will cancel okay. the negligence of the first lab right. and save so humanity. A reasonable a reasonable person would look at that situation and say, "Well, how about we don't muck about with smallpox anymore?" Despite the fact that we got really lucky and the errors and the benefits canceled one another out, it seems to anyone sensible that 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 was pure damn fluke, roughly speaking, and the idea that we should be delving into that particular bit of knowledge is ill-advised. That's what would happen, and that's what I think about that example. Okay, but it was it was a fluke in both directions, right? Sure, but that just shows that just shows that that messing about with the substance to begin with was ill 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 conceived. Any like any logical any logical investigator would con would would immediately conclude that it's like you're saying well. From a utilitarian perspective, the net consequence was basically zero, so... Not that, but again, to say that it was ill-conceived is a perfectly intelligible and defensible thing to say, but that doesn't at all suggest that anyone in either lab was wrong about the physical character of smallpox. Right. And we need a conception of truth. They were wrong in a more profound way. They were right about rearranging the chairs on the Titanic, but they were pretty damn wrong about the fact that it might sink. Okay, but that has nothing to do with the truth value of any statement about smallpox. It has nothing to do with if someone says, well, is this a, a retrovirus? We're going to wait to... The way that, it does the way that I define truth. We're going to wait to see if everyone dies or not before we answer that question. We can't think about scientific truth in that sense, again, for, for many reasons, but certainly because we can't wait around to see if everyone dies to find out if we're making sense in the present. Sure. The thing is, the thing is, Sam, we do think about it that way already. We think about it that way all the time. We think, well, messing around with smallpox is probably a bad idea because it might be fatal. Anytime we have any inkling that the outcome of a scientific experiment might be catastrophe on the broadest possible scale, we immediately decide that that's a bad idea. Well, of course, but that again, that that's not has nothing to do with epistemology. That has to do with danger and survival and risk and things that worry us. Right, which I would say are higher truths. So it does have something to do with epistemology. You can call them higher values, but they're not they're not truth in the sense that when it comes time to have a, an honest conversation about the factual accuracy of any statement about whether or not something is likely to be true, when you're talking about probabilistic truth, there you're not talking merely about the risk of species annihilation. I know, that's because you leave that question out of the, you leave that question out of the realm of consideration. And for good reason. Well, for good proximal reason, but maybe for bad distal reason. But for most things we want to talk about, there is no implication of danger on that scale at all. And yet we still have to make strong truth claims. We can make this as prosaic or as, or as weird as you want. If, if someone says that your wife is cheating on you, presumably that's within the realm of possibility, provided that you have a wife. 
and you are going to want evidence. And what would constitute evidence? Well, here's, here's evidence. I saw it in a dream. Well, that's bad evidence. Well, here's evidence. I hired a private investigator, and here are 17 pictures of her at various locations with a man you've never seen before, and he looks like Brad Pitt. Now, all of a sudden, presumably you're interested, right? Now, the claim about whether or not she's cheating on you is an intelligible claim. We could drill down on what it might mean. Does, it, does she have to be having sex with this person to be cheating on you? Well, let's say, yes, she does. Okay, so then there's a claim about what she's actually doing with this person in a locked room somewhere when you're not around. That's a claim that has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not you wind up killing yourself based on your reaction to this unhappy truth. If you then wound up killing yourself, we could say at the end of the day, well, it would be better if he hadn't known that. It would certainly be better if she hadn't done that. It would have been better if he had married a different woman. Surely we would want to say that. It might be a better if he would have paid attention to his damn marriage and to attribute the, sure. and to attribute the cause of his demise to the existence of the photographs. This is why I brought up Josh Green, is that investigations into this kind of morality always frame it in Jordan, such a way that... Jordan, you have to grant one thing here. There's one piece that doesn't get moved here. You cannot move the piece that because you killed yourself, it's not true that she was having an affair. That move is not open to you, and yet you're acting like it is. Well, you know, I think we've been going down this road for so long that I'm not exactly capable of them at the moment of making the micro uh, example, macro example leap, because you're making a case there that it's sort of quasi associated with science. That's the photographic evidence and the realism that's associated with that. And then you're making the claim that, you know, it's not true that she wasn't having an affair. I'd have to take that apart more. He killed himself. Like you're throwing a lot of things into that example that I believe are contextually important to my unpacking the ethics behind it. You know, because you're equating the fact that she had an affair to him committing suicide, which, you know, there's a whole backstory there. And it also depends to a large degree precisely on what you mean by an affair, which was something that you brushed over. So, you know, you're acting. That's the problem with these damn micro examples is that, and this is why I don't trust Josh Green's work. It's because you you set up a narrative that's completely fictional and you act as if each of the subcomponents of the narrative are isolated truths that have no external context. You say, well, the external context has no bearing on the issue at hand. And that's just generally not true. It has a lot of bearing on the issue at hand. Well, it bears on some of it, and there's other parts which it obviously can't bear on. Well, here's, I'm, I'm just okay, asking well, that you distinguish no, those two. here's an example, man. I've been in courtrooms. I've been in courtrooms lots of times, say, with divorce cases. You know, and the, the, the issue of what constitutes an affair, which you brushed over, you know, when you said, well, it may depend on what kind of sex is going on, whether or not it's technically an affair, it's like, the photographic evidence of her in bed with another man would not necessarily be enough to convict her of having an affair in a court. You're assuming that the photographic evidence is prima facie evidence of the affair. And the way you're doing that is by circumscribing no. the definition of affair such that it fits with your notion of factual evidence. You might say, well, it's certainly the case that she was having sex with another man. Jordan, I'm just using it to demonstrate that it doesn't make sense to subordinate our conception of truth or the factual accuracy of any given description of reality to what happens perhaps in some distant future vis-a-vis -vis the survival of anyone. Now, we can talk about the survival of people and of the species as our primary concern. That's a totally valid thing to care about. Why, in fact, there's Why very is few it things. valid? Why is it valid? 
if it doesn't if it isn't at the top of the hierarchy of truth claims, why the hell would you bother subordinating science to it? As you point out, there are there are things that are more important than understanding reality scientifically. Hey, great. That's exactly my point. You're not making that point by using this Nietzschean conception of truth. What you're doing uh, is yeah. making it very difficult to talk about facts. It's more of a Darwinian conception of truth than a Nietzschean one. I mean, Nietzsche just referred to it obliquely, but you just admitted that there are... But the truth is, is not even a Darwinian conception of truth. It's certainly not a Darwinian conception of Darwinism, because the truth value of a Darwinian description of biology is not predicated on any harms that may come on the basis of people thinking in those terms. That's an additional oh, thing we claim, can be concerned a, about. Sure, sure. But there's a claim inside Darwin, Darwinian thinking, which was recognized by all the pragmatists, who were very, very smart people, that you, the truth metaphysic, there's truth metaphysic nested in Darwinian, Darwinian theory, which is that you don't, you don't have access to the truth, even if you think you have. The best you have are the truths that support the probability that you will continue with your existence and the existence of the species. And there is no, no. truth outside that. And you're saying, yes, there is. There's a root. There's that is not the pragmatic conception of truth. The pragmatic conception of truth is not merely anchored to the Darwinian logic of evolution and survival. No, they considered it a subset of pragmatic thinking. As soon as Darwin published his work, the American pragmatists, particularly Dewey, but also William James, jumped on it instantly and said, well, yeah, well, there's an example of the work of the, of the, uh, what, the generalizability of our claims about pragmatic truth. It's even the case in the biological world. And there's no way outside of that. And that's not my invention or my particular interpretation. I mean, that drove an entire, that drove the fundamental American philosophy, pragmatism. Again, I've been very close to pragmatism because I was just endlessly haranguing Richard Rorty in person about these things. But most of what we talk about, most of the statements we want to make about reality that have some truth value or not, however dimly we can see the, the basis of it or not. Most of this content has no obvious connection and may, in fact, as a matter of the history of the species, have no actual connection to our survival. Why do you care about well-being then? Like, you know, you're, to me, you're making two paradoxical moral claims at the same time. On the one hand, Again, you're, you're, a, you're, a, you're wanting to move on to another topic, which is totally understandable at this point, but well, I think it's it's, it's partly because the uh, when you're talking about the other topic, I think that you're you will necessarily land up in the position that I just described if you if you pursue it far enough. Not if I can't make your position make sense when talking about terrestrial reality or even fictional reality. So I, I could say, for instance, that in Shakespeare's play Hamlet, Hamlet was the Prince of Denmark, right? Now, that is a factually true statement about a fictional world. Hey, you talked about white lies, right? Jordan, please. I'm not, I'm not skipping off the topic. I'm directly addressing it. Something can be true at one level of analysis and not true at another. That happens all the time. That's what a white lie is. It happens all the time. And the reason we're stuck on this discussion is because you won't allow me to make a distinction between provisional factual truths, which I, I don't want to dispute because it's self-evident that they're correct. But that isn't what I'm saying. I'm saying that there's an underlying metaphysics that's at question here. There's two different claims you could be making when you call them provisional, one of which is obviously valid and which every sane scientist makes, which is to say that, that we are working within a a set of theories and a set of tools which don't give us ultimate confidence that our current description of reality is true and will never be falsified. We're making falsifiable claims about the world in a Popperian sense, many of which have not yet been falsified and which therefore are still in good standing. Okay, would you say that one of those would you say that one of those falsifiable claims is that the work that we're doing in the lab 
is beneficial not to mankind. No, but you need well, not are make. Are you that, sure? Because so, that is But Jordan, you need not make claim. that claim. You could make that claim, or you could make a claim that it's harmful, or you could make the claim that it's neither beneficial nor harmful, and yet it's still intelligible in that context to say that what I'm doing in the lab is no less true. Yeah, but people it may not don't be useful. Do they, 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 people don't do that in the real world. They always claim that what they're doing is of benefit, and that's because they recognize the fact that whether or not it's of benefit trumps whether or not it's factually true. Okay, but Jordan, now we've been doing this for two hours, and my only claim is that you have to be able to distinguish these variables. It is intelligible to say that in one lab, they have a true theory, factually accurate, which is allowing them to do all kinds of things that they wouldn't be able to do if they were mistaken about what they believed. But they're doing things that are harmful because they're bad people, right? Or negligent people. That is, unfortunately, an all too common situation that we are then in. Their theory, then their theory about what they're doing is wrong. You think that you can take the theory, their theory of smallpox independently of their nefariousness. And I would say, no, you can't. You can't. Because you, you're willing, there's an archaeological dig that's going on here. We'll say, there's a proximal claim, and then there's a claim underneath that, and then there's a claim underneath that, and then there's a claim underneath that, which might be a moral claim, which I would say is something like at the bottom. And I would say, well, nefarious people can't have a truthful view of smallpox virus. It's not possible. And you might oh, say, wait well, a if, minute. You just parse Jordan... out, if you just parse out there the little empirical description, it's identical to the empirical description of the benevolent person. And I would say, well, then you're just drawing your borderlines around your truth claim inappropriately. It's a matter of depth. We could make it even worse for you than that. We could make the, the lab of good people fundamentally confused about the nature of smallpox, right? So they're good people. We need to be able to talk about their goodness because they have good intentions. But when you actually look at what they believe about smallpox, it's wrong. Wrong by what standard? That standard cannot be their goodness. It can't be okay. the survival of the species. It has to have to do with the details of molecular biology. If you put them in opposition to the lab of bad people who have an accurate, that is, true understanding of smallpox, again, the concept of truth floats free of anyone's intentions here. And you, it seems to me you have they to grant just, me they that. Just have an error. They just have an error at a different level of the archaeological dig. So they're good people, we'll say, but their their proximal definition of smallpox is wrong. And that's also not from the Darwinian perspective. I didn't say that good people necessarily always make good decisions. I never said that, or that, or that being good necessarily provides you with... Let's make these the perfectly good, wise people who would make good decisions with an accurate understanding of smallpox. It just so happens, however, that they're bad biologists. Again... The crucial thing is that you, you need the conceptual tools to be able to make these distinctions. Okay, then I would say that the probability that they're perfectly good people and they're biologists and they're studying smallpox is, is so negligible that the example doesn't make sense. And this is the problem I have with these toy moral uh, conundrums, is that you get to define the context of the conundrum and leave out what you want. And that makes it easy easier to win the argument. But they're not real. Well, like, well no, I dealt cause... with people in real world conundrums a lot, like a lot. And the first problem with a real world conundrum is it's damn near impossible to define it. You have to dig and dig and dig and dig and dig. You know, so you have pictures of your wife having an affair. OK, so fine. No problem. So then I spend like two years digging into the situation and I find out that you know, to call what she did an affair, given your behavior in the entire 10 years beforehand, is such a perversion of the truth that it makes your photographic evidence not only irrelevant, but positively malevolent. So it's not that easy. Again, like, you're, you're, seizing, that easy. you're seizing upon superficial features of my example that don't actually change the significance of the example, at least from my point of view. Jordan, this is what I'm tempted to do at this point. We have, because now I'm, as a podcast host, I'm, I'm worried about the, the end product here and about the, the patience of our listeners, a vast number of whom really want us to talk about these things. I think what we should do here, 
is pause. You and I have had a, a two-hour-plus conversation about epistemology, where we seem to differ. I honestly, I still can't convince myself that when push comes to shove, we really have a different conception of truth here. I feel like you are committed to playing a language game by certain rules of your own design here, which, which are not helping you achieve clarity with an interlocutor like me or, or anyone else on this topic. It's going to be hard to talk about the connection between scientific truth and moral truth, which I know you want to talk about and I want to talk about, but I'm not going to be as good as I should be going forward if we just start from this place and log another two hours. And I, and I know we're not going to have an audience that wants to listen to a four-hour podcast when we're at the two-hour mark here. So what do you think about this plan? We break here. We release this conversation. One thing that will be interesting for me is if anyone can point out to me what I am missing about your argument thus far. Because you are reacting to me like there is, there is something you are saying that makes sense that I'm not seeing that does actually nullify the import of the kinds of toy examples I have been putting forward. And I don't see it. If there can be a Reddit thread that performs a post-mortem on this that shows me how I'm wrong, I would love to see that. I will read it, and I will take instruction from it, and I will come back to a second conversation with you, duly chastened, and revise how we proceed talking about this. But Yes, well, I might emerge duly chastened as well, you know, but, but because I think we're differing on something fundamental, but... Let's crowdsource this, because I actually... I'm not following the plot here, if in fact that's true. So with your permission, I recommend we pause here, we release this to our mutual fans, they do a crowdsourced postmortem on it, and then we see where we are. I think that's a fine idea. Okay, awesome. Yeah, absolutely, because, yeah, I know there's, there's no sense. Well, we're circling the same territory, yeah, you know, and, yeah. and, taking, and taking aim at the same problem from different angles. And you know, it's, it's, the question is obvious to me, it's obvious that we're approaching this from, I would say almost different ontological perspectives. Now the po the possibility is that there's something just flawed with the way that I'm setting up this argument, um, or there's something flawed with the way that you're setting it up. Although there's nothing incoherent about the way you're setting it up, but by no means, part of it stems on how you're willing to conceptualize truth and and that well look man it's no wonder we argued about that for two hours because that's a really hard question i don't think it's as hard as you're making it out to be and i think that you'll be surprised if we moved into the other topic i think you are assuming there are implications of my views about grounding morality in science say that you are, yeah that i yeah. think don't exist so i think you think we're farther apart on questions of morality and value than we probably are. And then you're plowing that assumed difference into this part of the conversation and kind of grappling with it there. I just think it's just not the case. You will find that I, I have no hesitation at all, for instance, in subordinating the scientific project to questions of what will maximize human flourishing in the end. I mean, if you can show me a, a line of research that is bad for people, I am going to be no more enthusiastic than you are. But again, we can't reduce the concept yeah, but, of well, truth to but, that. Well, that's that is the question. Is because yeah. that is exactly the question. It's it's I I don't think that you can make both those claims simultaneously. And you think there's no problem in making them. And and that's fine. You know, like it's a complex, it's a complex question. Let's throw ourselves on the mercy of our listeners and I think see what that's happens. a fine idea. I really do. Well, listen, thank you for your time. And, and despite how wrapped around the axle we got here and how tight I might have sounded to you at various moments, I appreciate your taking the time to do this. And I remain open to further discussions. The, the feeling is mutual. It's like, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm under any illusions that this is an issue that's easy to solve. It's a fundamental, it's a fundamental issue. And I could well be wrong about it, you know. I am reasonably confident your use of truth here will prove unpragmatic, even by your own standards. But let's see. 
we'll call this part one of our conversation. Sounds good, Sam. And hey, look, I really appreciate the invitation and with and also the conversation. You know, like it's you 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 are are very good at generating a barrage of intelligent objections. You know, and that's 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 great. You know, because one of the things you want to find out about a claim is whether or not it can stand up to genuine criticism. You know, you talked about making an Iron Man out of your opponent, right? Not Steel Man, and yeah, that was from Steelman. yeah, exactly. Eric Weinstein, yeah. Yes, precisely. Yes. And so, you know, um, you're you're a pretty good steel man. And that's the sort of person that I'm interested in having a discussion with. We both have many fans and detractors who will work this out for us. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. Needless to say, I wish you well in your collisions with social justice warriors and everyone else who are still at your doorstep, no doubt. So keep up your energy and our paths will cross again. Thanks, Sam. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. You can leave reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to it. You can share it on social media with your friends. You can discuss it on your own blog or podcast, or you can support it directly at samharris.org forward slash support.